really good uh, to be here this beautiful morning. This is really good. Thank you for that singing. I, that last song, I have to say, by far and away, the last few years has been my absolute favorite song. And I can't help but just want to sing it. Um, I like to cry along with that song. I just love this beautiful theme of Christ living in me. And what a privilege. What a privilege it is to, to uh, not only sing about it, but that, that this is a reality. Christ indwelling, that he would live in me. That's, that's a wild idea. It's amazing. And so I give God thanks and uh, praise. It's extremely, extremely humbling to sing through the gospel story like that. And, um, and just to stop and thank God for what he's given to us. Absolutely essential. Well, it is a privilege to be here at Kenora Bible Church. It's really neat. And uh, I've been here, like was said, something like 25 years ago, back in the days when D.K. Friesen was here. Some of you remember him. Some of you were probably not here at that time. And uh, he invited us to come out here. And I think he was actually trying to twist our arms to come and, and, and be pastor here at the time or something like that. But um, the Lord led us different ways, and, and that's all been good. That's all been good and just fine. Um, what a privilege it is. We had a really nice day yesterday. You know, my friend Mark and Ange, Angie there, we've known them for like more than 25 years. Um, I don't remember when I first met Mark like years and years ago. Probably, uh, I don't know, that we were teenagers, I guess. And, um, and we used to go to the same youth retreats and s stuff like this. We had a great time. So we had a great time yesterday. He gave us a ride on the lake. What a fun time that was. Thank you so very much for that. Um, that was uh, really a special treat. So it's been a great weekend here to come up here and be with you. Um, so I want to share with you from John chapter 17 this morning and quite exciting uh, text, actually. I'm, I'm extremely humbled again, just thinking about it and going, how in the world um, am I supposed to speak? This is, this is amazing. But all the, as I've been preparing and thinking of coming up here, it was like, I, I just couldn't get away from this text. And so um, let's go. We're going to do this. Um, I want to share with you uh, a highlight of my summer this year was the, was, um, was back in Father's Day, my birthday's right around that time, my oldest daughter, my wife, and, and I'm not sure about the other children if they got in on this thing, but they bought me a telescope. And telescopes are really, really neat if you've ever had one. And um, this, this, this telescope is nice. I don't know, I, I remember what model number, I don't know anything about that stuff really. I just like looking in it, right? And, and seeing stuff. And uh, it was, you gotta wait till it's pretty dark at, at night. So, you know, we have long summer days, so usually I was too tired. I, I didn't really do anything with it until about a couple weeks ago, about two, three weeks ago, later in August. And, uh, and um, we're looking out one night, we go for a little walk, and, and I go, wow, we live in the country, by the way. It's really nice. We're going for a walk, and it's, and it's dark, and it was just getting dark. And I go, oh, there's some nice, spectacular things. i, I got to get that telescope going tonight. So we go... We take it out and get her all set up, and it's like, whoa. It was a full moon, too. So we're just, first we just gazing at the moon, like, and it was a bright full moon. We were just zooming right in on that thing. You're just like, oh, you could just see all the rough parts of the surface of the moon. It was really amazing. But the full moon, it was so bright that actually, when you step back from the telescope, you could actually see light coming out the lens. It was just crazy, and it was actually, after you looked at it for a bit, your, your eyes were going a little crazy. It was like, wow, that thing was so bright. It was, it was just beaming bright. And then we go like, well, there's quite the significant thing, not too far from the moon right there. Let's zoom in on that thing. You know, we, I hadn't been looking at the charts of the skies, what I should be seeing right about now, and I'm zooming in. I go, I bet you about this time of year we should be able to see Jupiter. This is my thought, right? So we're zooming in on it, and sure enough, there it was. And you could see Jupiter. And you could see, uh, that night I could see three of its moons through the telescope. And it's like, well, that is really neat. Well, I'm, all, I'm, I'm just like pumped. This is so cool. And um, I mean, I totally forgot that there was such a thing as COVID and stuff like that for a while. It's just so cool. And uh, so I 
I, we, we bring it back into the house, and it's all nice, and we're just talking and having a good time and thinking about what we saw. And then my daughter goes, Dad, I just looked at my phone. They say you can see Saturn tonight, too. I go, what? Get the telescope. Out we go. And uh, out we go, and we, we get the thing lined up, positioned where we could see it, and then we zoom in. It's, like, oh. it, it, it's, it's quite small. And it's a little white dot. You can see with your, with your plain naked eye, you can, you can see a little white dot in the sky, but you zoom in on that thing, and you see this little circle, and you see these brilliant, colorful rings around it. It was absolutely stunning. And, I mean, it's quite small. I mean, you're looking through this little eyepiece, but it's amazing. And when you get the focus in, it's like, wow. That thing was brilliant. I, mean, I was so pumped I could hardly sleep that night. It was so much fun to see uh, Jupiter and Saturn. That was just wild. I, I guess going to heaven is really going to surprise me. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> Uh, wow. Well, anyways, um, you know what? The telescope, that was so cool because you're, you're staring at this thing and you're looking at something that's out of this world. I mean, it's in the created universe, but it's outside of our little earth and its atmosphere. And it's so much above and beyond all that's going on here. And it doesn't seem like it's really having any trouble with what's going on on earth. And the politics and all that's not really troubling Saturn and Jupiter. And you're staring at it and then just enjoying it. You know, I believe that the God's word is very much like the telescope. That's all right. I've got to stay here, right? And it's so much like that. You take God's word, you open it up, and it's like a lens into that which is so far higher and above and beyond what we have in this little earthly, physical, material world. And it just lifts you, and you see something so brilliant lifts your heart and I hope that you make a practice every day of getting into God's word and reading it and studying it for yourself and knowing it and that in the church that you're, you're you know the focus is what is God saying in his word at constantly well I tell you John chapter 17 is an incredible view and out of this world view, I would like to say, uh, of the eternal and the wonder of God. And this is an amazing prayer. So we just read the last few verses of it, which is, I'm tr going to try to get the focus there. But I'm just going to mention something about this prayer briefly, a couple things. And uh, we'll get to that. And I hope it will be uh, end up with something very practical for us all here. The setting of the prayer, of course... We call it the high priestly prayer. You could just call it the Lord's Prayer. You know, next time someone says, uh, can you recite the Lord's Prayer? Just open to John 17 and start reading it. This is our Lord's Prayer for us, right? And, um, I mean, the other one that we call the Lord's Prayer that's often recited, really, he says, here, pray this way. It was like the disciples' prayer here. This is how you should pray. But here's the Lord's Prayer for us in John chapter uh, 17. And the setting of this prayer is very interesting in fact, the first five verses, Jesus is there. He prays for himself and he prays, Father, glorify me, you know, as I've glorified you. And uh, amazing, amazing words. And verse five, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. Um, verse, uh, the second part, the second view you see here is verse 6 to 19. And we generally say that Jesus here is praying for his disciples. And he prays for his disciples. And when you look through the prayer, you actually see in many ways Jesus is discussing things with his father. He does ask for his disciples, but he says, you know, Father, I have shown you to them. I've shown you. I've given them your name. And we see here that Jesus shows the father to his disciples. To share, and they could share in Jesus' nature. This is an amazing prayer as Jesus prays this prayer. And he prays for his disciples that they would share with what Jesus has. In verse 13, I want them to share my joy. I want them to have my joy. In uh, verse uh, 14, he says, he, they're, they're not of this world. Just as I'm not of this world. We're sharing in this, this separateness, this uniqueness of Jesus. And verse 18, just as I was sent, I send them. We share in the mission, in the same sending, the same sending. Jesus was sent into this world. He sends his disciples. We're sharing 
in the, really, I, I put it down here, is this we share in both the nature, the character, and the heart of Jesus. Jesus is praying this prayer. At a very interesting time in history, the greatest moment in history, he is praying this prayer, this, this we call high priestly prayer. He is, he is about to be arrested. The betrayal is already going on. He is about to be arrested and falsely tried and accused and murdered and hung on a cross. All of this in the, in the plans of, of God that he would die and bear the sins of the world. That he would die and bear all the sins of the world. And while he is doing that, you know, most, I guess most human, our focused prayer would be, if we know we're about to go through a massive trial, we would be praying about that trial and we would just be praying, oh God, help me. And here he is praying for his disciples after this. That all of this would lead to glory. And he prays for his disciples. And then he doesn't only just pray for his disciples. In this amazing time, he prays for the believers in Kenora. At this amazing time, he prays for believers that would come. All the believers that would come after them who would believe. For those who would believe the message that they would tell, the testimony of those first disciples and the apostles. All these. Oh, I pray for them too. So Jesus, here is his astonishing prayer for us. This is amazing. And I, I looked at this and as I stared at this, there's a couple of general thoughts I want to share and, and then we'll, we'll, we'll just unpack a, a couple of observations here. Hopefully there will be some practical stuff for us all here. But I looked at this prayer and I thought, man, if I summarized it in a line, Jesus is saying, to his father. He says, I pray for them too. That they could have what we have. And that's something. That's a little summary. Oh, that they could have what it is that we have. See, the prayer here for us is, is rooted in the very uh, nature of what God is like. It's rooted in the very character of God. It's rooted in the heart of God. That's what he's praying about. He's not praying about, oh, 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 I hope they get along when the masks mandate come along, you know, or I hope they can work these things out or whatever, you know. I hope they don't get too unsettled or this or that. And I suppose that can be part of the prayer, but it's so much greater. It's rooted in the very nature, the character and heart of God. I hope I can explain that. And I, I'd say nature, character, and heart, like these three things really as I look at this prayer and I see what Jesus is asking, I'm going like, in a sense, the very nature of God, the very character of God, the heart of God should be on display amongst all believers. That's an amazing prayer. That somehow all believers would put this God of theirs on display. I, I use a big word here. I don't know. I hope I don't go into some sort of almost heretical words here. But he says, that I, I wrote it this way, we, that we would be a manifestation of God. You know, just a revelation of God. Somehow a supernatural life of God as redeemed image bearers. So, think about that. Redeemed image bearers. Remember Adam and Eve when God created Man, he said, in, in his image. And we know what happened to this image. It's been tarnished by sin all the way through. And now we've been redeemed through the very blood of Jesus. And we are to be fresh bearers of God's image in this world. Redeemed image bearers. Somehow there's something about the church that God is evident. There's something about God in this fellowship that the world would know. 
Now there's a lot of things about God. And I'm going, this, this passage isn't that long. How can we, how can we be going? What's all this about God? And just bring it in here and put them on display. Well, the one thing I, I actually want to mention here is that God is triune. And you go, well, that doesn't sound like our major text on Trinity. But this is important. I really believe it's important. How much time do we have anyway? I, don't even, I didn't check how long we're supposed to go like this. Two hours? Okay, okay, two hours, that's good, you know, because I know, I know I've traveled to Asia a few times, and I know if you sit down too soon, they get disappointed. Anyways, um, although that's usually not the issue in North America. Usually it's like, man, that guy can talk a long time. Uh, think about the Trinity for just a moment. We are sometimes as Christians somewhat uncomfortable with the Trinity because we don't know how to explain that. You know, we got one God and three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We want to explain it to our children, and we don't know how to do it. So some people will say, well, he's like an egg. Well, the Trinity is not like an egg, really. <laughs> it's kind of, we've come up with some pretty wild ideas, you know, about what the Trinity, what it looks like. Well, a couple of the main texts that we know in Scripture speaking of the Trinity. We think of Matthew uh, 28, 18 through 20, where Jesus gives the great commission when he says that all authority has been given to me. And he tells them now, therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All three are, are stated as equals in the text. We think of the great benediction that Paul gives in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14, the grace of, of our Lord Jesus and the love of our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with you all. We think of these texts of the Trinity. It's true, we have a, a three in one, a three in one triune God. That's essential for us when we think about um, the text as we go forward here. Some would struggle with, well, the God, can God be a Trinity one? And there's the, you go into university campuses where Christianity is debated with Islam, for example, they will there will be this argument about, well, we are, the, we're the, you know, the Islam would say, we're the true monotheist. We don't believe in three. You're, you're, you believe in three. You believe in three. Well, it's interesting because Deuteronomy says, behold, the Lord is, is one. And, but if you go back to Genesis chapter two, where God made man his image, man, male and female, and they were, they were husband and wife. And the same word is used in the two shall be one. It's somewhat mysterious that two could be one. And the Godhead, three, is one. Three distinct persons, eternally coexistent, co-equal, yet one God. But it's wonderful. It's wonderful to think about just for a moment. So Mike Reeves is a theologian that spent a lot of time um, speaking about the Trinity. The, the Christian, he's from... Britain, and I don't know if any of you have heard of him, but I've really enjoyed listening to him uh, numerous times. A friend of mine has sent me some some audio of him speaking on this very subject, and he loves to compare um, uh, the, the idea of a pure, solitary monotheism versus a trinity, and he loves to compare the two, and you go, well, we have a triune God. We have a father. We have a son. A father who loves his son, who and the Holy Spirit, the three are enjoying each other for all eternity. The three of them have just had a rich relationship where they love each other for eternity and eternity past. For them to enjoy relations, they have no need. They have no need to create something, to relate to something, for they already are complete. And he compares it to this solitary God. One like in the, you know, prayed in the mind of man like Allah. Who's been alone for eternity. No one to talk to. No one to love. All by himself, kind of lonely and probably cranky. Someone, if he needed, if he wanted to love something, he needed his creation. A needy God, a lonely one, and the one who has no experience with love. 
We've got a God who loves. A God who knows all about relating. We'll come back to that in a moment. As we look at the text, verse 20 through 26, I'm just going to reread that again in John 17. Uh, I'm going to just use the New Living Translation here. It's just very easy reading and so uh, it's very easy also to listen to. So I sometimes I, I use this translation. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that we all, sorry, I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. O oh, righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed you to them and I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them, and I will be in them. Isn't that amazing text? Do you notice verse 21 uses these words, just as, when he prays for unity, just as you and I are one, just as. I'm praying for their unity, just as. We are one want them to have what we have. Just notice verse 22. I gave them the glory that you gave me so they may be one as we are one, just as we are one, or even as we are one. Verse 23 again. I and them, you and me, may they experience this perfect unity that the world will know you sent me and that you love them. How? Even as you love me. Even as the same. The same. Just like you loved me, you love them. Incredible. See what Jesus is praying. I believe Jesus is praying that you and I today, in our experiences and in our life, in our fellowship, in our work, that we would become imprints, reflections, and images, like a representation of God. A representation of the relations that are in the Godhead would be here too. The relations in that triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they with this eternal love for each other, that that would show up here. It would be manifested in the church of God. This relations in the Godhead, that the very nature of God would, would show up somehow in the church, that there would be the character of God would show up here and the very heart of God would show up here. And I say that in, in these ways uh, as we look at some of the things Jesus prayed here. Uh, the first one, I'm just going to mention five things very quickly here uh, as what Jesus prays. And verse, the first one is, was obviously unity. Powerful text on the unity of the church. I mean, the church should be one. It's not organizational unity necessarily. It's not that we should all be just one denomination or, or that sort of thing. Some kind of, sort of legal entity where there is only one Church allowed across the universe is not what he's talking about. But he's talking about 
the very nature of our fellowship that it's unified. To be one just as we are one. And it actually goes, it's so such strong language, it's such powerful language. It, he actually goes to a length that's so difficult to, for us to grasp mentally, right? Just as you and I are one. Then he says, my father, you are in me and I am in them. This fellowship, this union is incredible. It's a union. We say, whoa, Christ in me, yes. It's a union with Christ. It's actually a union with the triune God. I enjoyed um, a study we did this last spring by, a, by a, a person who's become a friend. I only talked to him through Zoom. He's in New Brunswick. He's written a, uh, a, a nice study called The Grace of God in Christ and all the all the gifts of God that are in Christ. Like he lists like a hundred things in the New Testament that we have because of the grace of God in Christ. It's a wonderful study. And one of the things he mentions in there, and it just blows your mind when you first look at it, it says, you've been invited to fellowship with the triune God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I mean, they just enjoy each other and you are welcomed to come and join. Absolutely staggering the unity that we have. It's because of the Lord. Well, of course, this unity is impossible apart from that third person of the Trinity who has who was sent when Jesus ascended. He sent the the uh, the Counselor, the one who would be with us forever. And in 1 Corinthians twelve thirteen, we are told that we've all been made to drink of the same. And so the very nature of God, which is one, three in one, should show up in our fellowship that we are one. Oh, we may have different views about, you know, which color mask is appropriate or the color of chairs or whatever. We can have lots of opinions about lots of stuff. But we're one. In fact, the variety of opinion is wonderful. I mean, when you hear beautiful music and when you hear harmony, you know, there's that, there's that little bit of a variety there. But it's, 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 a, it's still a cohesive unit. It's one. It's one. Unity. Glory. Jesus says. Jesus, as he prays for them. In verse 22, I have given them the glory you gave me. So that they could be one as we are one. Wow, he has shared his glory. And it's, a, it's an interesting text. Like, he shared his glory, but we, we, we're, we're thinking about the heavenly glories, right? But there's something about the glory of Jesus. Remember when Jesus came into this earth, and uh, John testifies in chapter 1, and verse 14, the word dwelt among, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory full of grace and truth. We beheld him. Jesus has shared his glory with us. It is a glory just to know him. It is a glory to be, to represent him and to have his presence in the Holy Spirit in our lives. It is a glory to be light today in darkness. It's privilege on privilege on privilege to be a believer. It's a glory to have a, a divine nature, to be a new creation, to be born of God's spirit. It's all glory. And by the way, it's not a, it's not a health and wealth idea either. Did you know that Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4, and Peter speaks so much about sufferings and the troubles that we have. And he talks about, well, if you suffer, you're suffering because of Jesus, because of the gospel of Jesus. If you're suffering, then he says that the spirit of glory rests on you. And, you know, I experienced that in some amazing ways. And we traveled to Myanmar a few years ago. And I was sitting there interviewing through an interpreter uh, a number of, of people who had spent time in prison. One pastor was telling the story how he went to this town and he was evangelizing. And one of the believing families, a couple of the believing families, had came to Christ. They were so much under pressure and that, that um, the community, it wasn't really uh, the authorities that organized it, the community organized this. They got a couple of 
trucks to dump a load of a stone, small stones in front of their house earlier in the week and on Friday night, seven o'clock, the community showed up to throw the stones at their houses until everything was leveled. And this pastor is telling me the story of this and many other oppositions. And I don't know, but there's something special about these people who've gone through such intense persecution. I'm sitting there and I can't get my eyes off them. I just want to listen to everything they say. And you can see that the confidence and just the glory of God resting on them. Another fella that we were we that I met in Myanmar had gone to he was put into prison and I believe it was on the Chinese side of the border in the Chinese prison he was put into prison. And while he was there he had the privilege of leading 18 other prisoners to Christ. Oh, what a privilege. And you know, a couple of years ago, he came to our, 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 our main leader, our friend there, and he said, can you please pray for me? Because I am praying that for some reason, God would send me back to prison because I want to lead more of them to Christ. The spirit of glory. You, you just, you love to hang around with people like this. You just, they're just special. Okay, that's not part of the notes. That's just bonus, all that. <laughs> Whew. What a glory to know Christ. At the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God came upon him as a dove and a voice of the Father. You see the Trinity at work there. And the Father speaks. You hear the voice from heaven say, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Wow, he shares his glory with us. Number, um, the third thing is this matter of love. And Jesus says, you love them. You love them. Verse uh, 23 and 24. I want them to experience this unity that the world will know. We'll come back to this matter of the world knowing right away. That you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. I want them to have what I have. The love that you have for me. I want you to, them to know that you love them just the same. That's incredible, isn't it? That's incredible. Is this sort of helping you kind of lift off above what's going on in our world? <laughs> just a little. It's just to say, wow, God loves me as much as he loves his son. Verse 24 I want those whom you have given me to be with me where I am. I want them to see the glory. We'll come back to that in a moment. But notice the words here. The glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. Here we have the triune God, this eternal love always there. That this is the very nature and character of God to love. God is love. John would say, 1 John chapter 4, even before the foundation of the world. Love is rooted in the eternal God. Existed in eternity past. You know, we've got a weird view of love in our world. It's like, oh, the world's going a little crazy. You know what? We could use a little. Somebody comes up with an idea one day. It's like, man, the world's crazy. There's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of unrest in this world. You know what we could use? What? 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 I've got an idea. There's this, there's this idea that maybe we could be kind to each other, or we could love each other. But that, where that idea come from, right? Love, love. This is this is eternal. This is an attribute of God that never changes. It comes from God, real love. And the word here, of course, is agape. The agape love of God. But our world, having forsaken God, or a world that doesn't know God, or verse 25 states, knows nothing of that love. It's only a sentiment. It's only a temporary sentiment to get what we want until the next time. You love them. Oh, by the way, do you ever struggle with God loving you? Is that a thing? Is that a problem here sometimes? Do you ever have that problem? 
kind of unsettled. Oh, how could God love me? It's kind of a human thing, isn't it? Well, as long as you spend all your time thinking about yourself, you're going to struggle with that one. But when we lift our eyes up to God and the very nature, the very character of God, it's a settled issue. He wants you to know that he loves you with the same love he had for his son in eternity past. It's incredible. It's incredible. Jesus is praying, I want them to have what I have. Jesus isn't insecure at all, is he? He's walking around. He's not insecure. Going, hmm, I don't bother. He just gets me. No. I mean, he can go to the cross. Fully assured. Fully secure. And you could go through difficult times. You could go through challenging times. And be fully assured of God's love. One theologian put it something like this. That one of the greatest affronts to God is to not believe that he loves you. You know, for a believer to think that God somehow stopped loving you. That he's not stopped loving you. Please don't, please don't take the world's garbage and let it influence your thinking. You have to discard it and refill on what God has said. God has demonstrated his love for us. Even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Well, God loves you so much, and he wants us to have what he has, so that means he included us also in his mission to the world. We can't skip that part. That's a very important part here. Jesus mentions the world numerous times throughout this entire prayer. And here as well. Verse uh, 23. I want you to, uh, sorry, back to 21 actually. First, I want this unity so that the world will believe you sent me. Verse 23. May they experience perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me. Jesus loves interested in this world verse 25 oh righteous father the world doesn't know you but I do and these disciples know you sent me I have revealed them to you or sorry I revealed you to them and will continue to do so you see the church is never ever to be self-serving we don't just come around and stop and go, oh, okay, let's just remind each other God loves us and go home. We do remind ourselves of that, but oh, we're never to be self-serving. God is giving. God is giving. I mean, just go through this, this, this prayer. You can do it later when you go, go home and we'll read through this entire prayer and see how many times the word giving is used. God is giving and so should we be. Verse 21, the world should believe. Verse 23, that the world should know. Verse 25, the world doesn't know, but these ones do. I've shown it to these. The world doesn't know, but these ones do. He, he, in his prayer there, he says, oh, oh, righteous father. I love that term. He, he says, righteous father. God is right. He's just. He's holy. Oh, righteous Father, the world doesn't know you. Now, that kind of explains everything, doesn't it? It kind of explains everything that's going on in our world, the, the chaos, the confusion, the fear the, that seems so often fear seems to trump every other thing. Because the world doesn't know you. And a world that doesn't want to acknowledge sin, but rather normalize sin. It just continues to normalize sin. Why? Because they don't know the righteous father. They just don't know. We can kind of get a little upset with this world sometimes. and go like, ah, But they don't know. See, they don't know the righteous father. And Jesus says, oh, but, 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 but. The world doesn't know, but I do. 
I know you. And these disciples know you sent me. Oh, there's a testimony. There's going to be a witness. These, I have made you known. They are now going to testify. They are the witnesses. And so is the church today. This great commission still stands. As Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. That you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. I have you revealed you to them and will continue to do so. And our love will be in them and I will be in them. Christ in us, the hope of glory. I want to bring one more thought here. Lastly, as Jesus prays, one of his prayers, he expresses his desire that those you have given me, and could be another sermon on that phrase, but we'll Leave that for now. But those you have given me should be where I am. They can see all the glory you gave me because you love me before the world began. This is Jesus' desire. This is pretty exciting stuff. Jesus is praying for us. And God hears. God answers Jesus. He says, oh, all these who believe, oh, I want them to be where I am. I want them to see the glory too. I want them to see all this glory. Oh, Christians, we have something the world doesn't have. They don't recognize the righteous father, nor do they have hope. We've got hope, the hope of glory. As Paul would say in Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Oh, our hope is wonderful. Titus chapter 2, Paul says, Paul, Paul writes to Titus and he says, the grace of God, which brings salvation, has appeared to all men. The grace of God has appeared and it teaches us to say no to ungodliness. While we wait for our blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Jesus is praying. I want them to have what I have. I want them to see the glory. I want them to be, have them with me in glory. I hope that floods your heart with hope. Glory now, of course. But the glory to be revealed isn't worth comparing, as Paul said in Romans 8, verse 17. So with that in mind, we have the glory, we have the future, we have the hope, we have all of this. Then today, oh, don't fret the small stuff. Don't fret all the small stuff. Don't get all bent out of shape that our world is kind of chaotic whether you talk about the pandemic or the politics or whatever goes on, you think about what's going to be the future of our country. I don't know. But let's not be distracted by these lesser things. You see, we've got a great big God to keep our eyes on and enjoy, and we have a gospel to tell. We still have to testify to our awesome God. Let's go tell. And we have a hope that completely supersedes all the fears and all the chaos. So in conclusion, I believe that our triune God expects to be on display right here in your fellowship. The triune God, the God of hope, the God of love, this righteous Father, anticipates being on display right here amongst us. He anticipates our fullness of joy and glory in his presence as well. We have great need. God anticipates that we as redeemed 
image bearers. That we would be armed with the good news and his divine love and committed to his divine mission. And I just say this, and, I, and the practical things that come to mind as I think of this is that I think so often we let so many little things get in the way. I hear of churches, board meetings, spending their entire time discussing what do we do about this mask mandate. When we need to be looking, how can we advance the gospel in this time? How can we help everyone see Jesus for all that he is? How can we be, as a church still be a display of the amazing God we serve, the amazing God who has redeemed us? Don't let the little things get in the way. So often, even within a fellowship, there can be misunderstandings. Oh, clear those up. They, they're just, they don't deserve to be a barrier or in the way of God being on display amongst his people. We have fears. Oh, bring them to the Lord. Bring your worries to him. Oh, oh, I see this word I wrote in here. Ay, ay, ay. Selfishness. <laughs> Did you see that? I can, can you believe I wrote about that in here? Selfishness. Selfish ambitions getting in the way. I believe God answers Jesus' prayer. Therefore, there, there can be an overwhelming sense of unity in your fellowship right here. There is great hope even for the very smallest of churches to fulfill God's purposes for them. Oh, that God would be on display like we read of in the book of Acts. It really is simple. It's not that, I, I don't want to just kind of rev you up and say try a little harder because that would be kind of wrong. But I would say this, that this is a faith life of total dependency on the Father to put us on display. I mean, back to the telescope, I started with these um, objects in the sky were out on display and they were amazing to see. I know the Bible tells us that we can look at the sky and go, wow. And there's something about God, the glory of God on display. As I'm looking at Saturn, I'm looking at Jupiter, and I'm enjoying the view. You know, Saturn and Jupiter, they're just reflecting the light off of our sun. Our sun. I see them because there's another source of light shining on them. You would be on display because of the light of God shining in your life. Because of God at work in you. So it's like the song we sang before. Yet not I, but Christ in me. Yet not I, but Christ in me. I will be, we want to be a manifestation or a reflection, an image bearer of God. But yet not I, but it's Christ. Pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for the time we could just share together from the scriptures. I pray, Lord, that, oh, Father, that we would just fill up on your word and fill up on all that you are, that we would meditate deeply on who you are, think deeply on who you are, to drink deeply and be completely satisfied with you. So that, so that we would, that we would be a display of your, of you, of who you are. You're in your nature, your character, and in your heart. And Father, it wasn't meant to just stop with us. We still see that you had a heart for this world, even this broken world, and you would choose to use us. Sometimes we, we don't see how we could be the one being used, but it won't be about us. It will be Christ in us. So may we, in faith, depend on you to shine brightly into our lives.
your glory and put it on display for the world. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for the time. Thanks for not leaving at noon like you did.